My name is Pat Gog and I work with the UW Extension Lakes team in the Wisconsin Lakes Partnership. Welcome to today's plenary session. I have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, Dr. Doug Tellamy. Doug is a professor in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware, where he has authored dozens of research articles and has taught insect taxonomy, behavioral ecology, humans and nature, insect ecology, and other courses for over 35 years. I learned yesterday, Doug's old school, he still uses a chalkboard. Awesome, huh? <laughs> Chief among his research goals is to better understand the many ways insects interact with plants and how such interactions determine the diversity of our animal communities. His book, Bringing Nature Home, how You Can Sustain Wildlife with Native Plants, was published by Timber Press in 2007, and he was awarded the 2008 Silver Medal by the Garden Writers Association. His other book, The Living Landscape, co-authored with Rick Dark, was published in 2014. Please help me give a warm Wisconsin welcome to Dr. Doug Tellamy. No chalkboard today. We're going to look at, look at some slides. I call this talk, Making Insects, a Guide to, to the, uh, Restoring the Little Things that Run the World. I gave this talk in Macon, Georgia a few weeks ago. So I just called it Macon Insects. <laughs> uh, and I want to start by, by, before we talk about how we're going to make insects, I want to talk about Edward O. Wilson. E. O. Wilson, one of the most famous scientists of our time. Um, certainly the most famous entomologist, myrmecologist, sociobiologist, conservation biologist. Um, what hasn't he done? He's the only scientist to win two Pulitzer Prizes uh, and writes a book every year. He's professor emeritus at, at Harvard. We could talk uh, for an hour about, about EO. But I was lucky enough to meet him twice uh, in my life. Once was early on in my career, 1982. There was a small conference on social insects in Boulder, Colorado. And it was small enough that there was no place to gather after the talk, so people just went outside and, and milled around. So after the first set of talks, we had break and went outside, and, and here's EO sitting on a curb, and nobody's sitting next to him. So very uncharacteristically, I went over and I sat down next to EO. And he turned and looked at me, he said, hi, I'm Ed Wilson, I don't believe we met. And we shook hands, and I said, yeah, I'm Doug Tallamy, and who knows what idiotic things I said to him, but. Break was over, more talks, and we had lunch and more talks, and then another break. I went outside, and here's Eo sitting on the curb, but nobody's next to him. And now we were buddies. So I went over, sat down next to Eo, and he turned, and he looked at me, he said, Hi, I'm Ed Wilson. I don't believe we met. <laughs> the second time I met him was 32 years later, and I did not remind him that we had already met. Um, he was getting the, the uh, Ben Franklin Award at the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. This was an award to celebrate his lifetime of contribution to science. Um, I also, I met Ben as well, but I was more excited, more excited to see Eo again. He was being, uh, it, it wasn't just to celebrate his lifetime contribution, it really was to focus on his efforts to save life on Earth, because he has been working on that pretty much his entire career. And one of the first things he wrote in that regard was this paper. Uh, it's, it's called The Little Things That Run the World, The Importance of, of Conserving Invertebrates. Uh, and he's largely talking about insects. This was in the first issue of conservation biology. It was a brand new discipline in 1987. And he, he had a very simple message. He said, life as we know it depends entirely on insects. And if we were to lose insects, some very nasty things would happen. First of all, most of the flowering plants on the planet would disappear. And that would change, that would, that would essentially end food webs that support reptiles and amphibians and mammals and birds, so they also would disappear. Uh, it would cause the biosphere to slowly rot because the insect decomposers that turn things over very rapidly would be gone. Uh, and, and yes, humans would disappear as well. So it was a, it was a pretty somber message. But in 1987, nobody was worried about insects disappearing, so it was considered theoretical, uh, one of these what-if articles, so it was, it was ignored. Besides, if we, 
if we depend on insects, why do we have National Insect Killing Week? <clears throat> now, this was 1929. Um, it was a campaign to boost the sales of all brands of chemicals to rid the community of, of insects. But let's face it, we still have National Insect Killing Day just about every day. It's springtime now, believe it or not, and soon you're going to hear the commercials. If you see insects around, call us, we'll kill them all. Doesn't matter what they are, we'll just come, come kill them all. Even if we do succeed in killing all the insects at home and all the insects in agriculture, we still have not been worried about losing insects in general because we have this idea that there are so many insects out there in our natural areas. <clears throat> there are two reasons why that's not true anymore. Um, one is that we don't have enough natural areas anymore. Now, up here in Wisconsin, that's a little harder for you to appreciate, but uh, come to the East Coast and you'll, you'll understand what I'm talking about. We've turned our natural areas into our cities, and they certainly are not designed to support insects. We've turned them into our, our suburbs, and they're not designed to support insects. Even our rural areas are not designed to support insects. Agriculture, we have 770 million acres of rangeland in the US. That is 18 times larger than the state of Wisconsin. It's designed to support cattle, and typically it's abused, it's overgrazed, and, and very few insects there. As a matter of fact, food production on planet Earth now claims half of the Earth's land surface. And that is not designed to support insects either. The second reason that our natural areas aren't doing a good job making insects anymore is that um, invariably they are invaded with plants from someplace else that are very poor at supporting insects. You're looking at White Clay Creek State Park, this is a park I drive by on the way to work. The University of Delaware, when I go to work, which isn't today. <clears throat> and every bit of green you're looking at is a plant from Asia. Right now, if I were to go home and take a picture at this spot, uh, the plants from Asia leaf out before plants from North America. So you're looking at that time period when uh, all the Asian plants are leafed out, but none of the native plants are leafed out. So every bit of green you see there is a plant that is not supporting insects very well. Uh, where do these plants come from? Well, they, they've come from our garden. They're, they're, you know, it's multiflora rose and oriental bittersweet and Japanese honeysuckle and bush honeysuckle and, and barberry and, and burning bush and calorie pear and privet and ailanthus and Norway maple, on and on. They're all escapees from our garden. So now about a third of the vegetation in an awful lot of our natural areas uh, are plants that are not supporting a lot of insects. So we are winning our war uh, against insects, even if it is now undeclared. Uh, and the good news is that we're starting to recognize this. New York Times carried articles about insect declines globally three times in, in 2018, which shows uh, they think this is a pretty important issue. And from the emails I get from people, a lot of people are thinking this is an important issue. Uh, so we can't solve a problem until we recognize it, and now we're finally starting to, to recognize it. Uh, we're measuring uh, losses of insects, so we know where we're starting from, what's already gone. They've done a better job in Europe than we've done in, in the U.S., but 50% of our Midwest nest, na uh, native bees have uh, disappeared from their historical ranges within the last century. We have four species of bumblebees that have declined 96% just in the last 20, 20 years, and you might say, well, 96%, they're not extinct yet, it's okay, but they're functionally extinct. There's now so few of them, they're no longer performing their roles in their, their ecosystems. Three species of bumblebees already are extinct. They are gone, and 25% of our bumblebee species are at risk of extinction. The news from Europe is uh, even worse. 30% of Europe's orthopterans, the grasshoppers, katydids, and crickets are facing extinction. A lot of bad news coming out of Germany, only because they have measured it better in Germany. 79% of Germans flying insects gone since 1989. 46 species of moths and butterflies already totally gone from, from uh, Germany. And this is the big one. Invertebrate abundance globally, and think insects again, has declined 45% since 1974. So the creatures that keep us alive on planet Earth here are disappearing. And I noticed nobody's standing up, running around, pulling your hair out, worried about this. Um, but what if I said your bank account is disappearing? Then I get your attention. Well, insects are the currency in our ecological bank accounts. And that's something we have to internalize a lot more than we already have. We humans are incredibly bad at assessing risks 
that we, we think are going to occur in the future. We don't seem to care much about the future. But we are pretty good, at least some of us are pretty good at, at feeling protective of other animals. We've got a lot of maternal instinct, we want to take care of them. So let's stop thinking about our own future and think about the future of, of animals. I want you to imagine that you are this bird, this magnolia warbler. So now you're this magnolia warbler, and you have just finished overwintering in the Talamanca Mountains of Costa Rica, and it is now time for you to fly north so you can reproduce. In other words, you're going to migrate, and migrate, migration is the most dangerous thing you're ever going to do in your lifetime. Storm deaths are very high. Uh, migrants, it's, very, it's physiologically stressful. They lose 35% of their body weight just crossing the, the uh, Caribbean Sea, the Gulf of Mexico. Once they hit land, if they, if they make it, um, they need to refuel constantly. Every time they stop to rest, they have to put on between 35 and 50% of their body weight by eating insects along the way. Uh, so migration is really hard. But if it's so hard on birds, if it's so risky on birds, why did it evolve? Well, like anything else, it, it evolved because the benefits of migration exceeded the costs. There were huge benefits to migrating. What are these benefits? The benefits are that migrants that came north to reproduce had more food to reproduce with. Of course, in the temperate zone in the spring, we had this giant flush of, of new foliage coming out, and that is followed very rapidly by a giant flush of the insects that eat that foliage. And that is what fuels migrant reproduction. That seasonal flush of food, of insects, does not occur in the tropics. The tropics are much more, more even and steady. Um, so the, you've got a spring bonanza of, of insects occurring in the temperate zone, and that gave birds an, an opportunity that they didn't have in the temperate zone, and that was to actually make more babies. If they stayed in the temperate zone, they could make two to four babies in a year. If they moved to the, to, no, if they stayed in the tropics, if they moved to the temperate zone, they could make four to six offspring per year. It was increased reproduction that balanced the cost of migration. <clears throat> So let me emphasize this. Bird migration was only adaptive because there were a whole lot of insects in the temperate zone to help them balance the, the costs of that mig migration. Now we keep upping the costs of migration by throwing up barriers for, for migrants, and we've done a lot of that in, in recent decades. Um, window strikes, for example. There was an article again, New York Times this morning, about window strikes. A billion birds a year killed by, by window strikes. Cats, of course, you've heard about cats. Two to three billion birds killed by house cats every year. So now we're up to three billion birds lost. That's about a third of the total North American bird population lost just to those two causes right there. About 100 million birds killed by cars every year. And these are all risks that didn't used to exist for migrants. So now they need to, to reproduce even more in the temperate zone to balance the losses they suffer from their, their migration each year. How many insects does it take for a bird to reproduce? This is a, a, an underappreciated uh, statistic. Um, we've got statistics for a number of species. I always talk about chickadees. 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to make one clutch of chickadees. One pair of chickadees, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars for them to reproduce. Now when migration evolved, and by the way, chickadees are tiny birds. That's, that's a third of an ounce. That's four pennies worth of bird. So you're talking about a lot of insects to support uh, breeding once these migrants reach North America. When migration evolved, there were a lot of insects in the temperate zone, and everything worked out. So the question now is, are there still enough insects to balance the risks of migration, the costs of migration, once those migrants get here? Can they reproduce enough to, to make it a worthwhile uh, life history trait? And in most cases, unfortunately, every time somebody measures it, the answer is no these days. Not only because we kill insects every chance we get, but because we are changing the, the base of the trophic system, the first trophic level, those plants that make the insects. We're taking away the native plants that make them and replacing them with non-native plants that don't make a lot of insects. And I'm gonna review quickly one, one little simple study that I did with an undergrad a few years ago just to demonstrate this. We went into hedgerows 
uh, and ag fields in Maryland, Delaware, and Pennsylvania, and we looked at hedgerows that were invaded, like this one, a lot of autumn olive here, and all those other, other guys, and compared the caterpillars in invaded hedgerows with the caterpillars in uninvaded hedgerows. Uh, and we found that there was a 68% reduction in the number of species of caterpillars in the invaded hedgerows, a 91% reduction in the abundance of those caterpillars, and a 96% reduction in the biomass, the amount of food available for breeding birds. Reduced it by 96%. So essentially, you've taken it all away when you allow these invasions to occur. Um, and this loss of insects that's clobbering bird reproduction wherever we have these invasive plants uh, is, is not just hitting a few obscure birds. It's all of the common birds that, that breed in North America and also that are, are migrants. We have 386 species of neotropical migrants that need these insects once they get, get up here to justify their migration. That includes our swallows and our swifts, our orioles, our hummingbirds, our vireos, our tanagers, our buntings and flycatchers and thrushes and warblers, our, our poor bobolink over here, all kinds of birds migrate and depend on those insects once they get here. And the fact that we're losing those insects might help explain why the, the uh, State of the Birds report in 2016 recognized 432 species of North American birds now threatened with extinction in North America. And that doesn't mean there's only five left of each one of those species. It means that the, the uh, population trajectory is headed down. They are declining so rapidly that we now recognize that is the signal for uh, um, threatened extinction. And a lot of people say we have to slow the rate of decline. No, we have to stop the rate of decline and, and cause them to increase back up to their, their uh, normal levels. We have 1.5 billion fewer breeding birds today than we had just 40 years ago. Let me remind you, a billion is a thousand million. That's a lot of birds that are not here now that used to be here 40 years ago. And this is an example of shifting baseline. I know everybody in this room is under 40, which means you were not here when there was 1.5 billion more breeding birds in North America, which means you don't recognize that they're not here now. Your baseline is to, have, to go outside and it's quiet. That's normal to you. So you don't recognize the problem, which means you're not going to act on the problem. None of us here miss the passenger pigeon. It used to be the most numerous bird on the planet, about four billion of them. Totally gone, we don't miss them, shifting baseline. And of course, if we eliminate insects, we're going to eliminate all the things that, that eat those insects. That's, those are those food webs that EO was talking about. Um, and if you look carefully at terrestrial food webs, insects are almost always involved. All spiders eat insects or they eat other spiders that, that ate insects. If we lost our insects, we would lose our frogs and our toads, all of the amphibians, because they all eat insects. So do our lizards, so do our bats, so do our rodents, and they eat them because they're really good food. Pound for pound, there's, there, some studies have shown twice as much protein in insect meat as there is in beef. And they have organs in their abdomen called fat bodies that are loaded with lipids, high energy compounds that allow these, these little guys to grow quickly and reproduce quickly. And if you're a mouse, that's what you want to do because there's a lot of things that want to eat you. But it's the same reason that larger organisms are eating insects. They are just really good food. The skunk is digging up your yard to get the grubs that are in your yard. Possums eat a lot of insects. Raccoons eat a lot of insects. Even things we don't think of as insectivores eat a lot of insects, like the red fox, the most common predator globally on every continent except Antarctica. 25% of its diet is, is insects. 23% of a black bear's diet is insects. So it doesn't matter how big you are, you need insects. Even if you don't eat insects, like this sharp shin hawk here, it's a bird predator, you need insects. You might think, well, I can, I can get rid of all the insects in my neighborhood and still have sharp shin hawks because they eat birds. But if you've got rid of all the insects in your neighborhood, you've gotten rid of the birds that this guy eats. He needs them indirectly. So does the garter snake. It's not eating insects directly, at least not very many. It's eating the frogs and toads that ate the insects. So a world without insects is a world without biological diversity. And again, EO reminds us, a world without biological diversity is a world without humans. And that's why this is an important issue for everybody. Whether you're a tree hugger, whether you're a, quote, environmentalist, that term drives me crazy, as if there are people on the planet that do not need a healthy environment. 
whether you live in Manhattan or Beijing, whether you hate all the life around you, you need biological diversity or you're not going to continue to exist on planet Earth. So our only viable option is to learn how to live sustainably with the world that sustains us. There is no other option. How are we going to do that? Well, let's talk about where we're going to do it. We have parks and we have preserves. And right now, that's where, that's where nature is huddled. And they're vital for that reason. But they're not big enough. They're too small. They're too isolated from each other. They are not the future of conservation. The future of conservation is on private property because 85.6% of the land east of the Mississippi is privately owned and 83% of the entire country is privately owned. We can't take away 83% of the whole country and say, well, we're going to save biodiversity. We need to save it on private land. We need to save it in places like that. So how are we going to save insects at, at a home, home like that? Roy Dennis is a, a uh, land manager in England, and he recently said that land ownership is more than a privilege. It's a responsibility. And I wish I had said that, because that is, that is so, so true. You know, planet Earth is covered with a very thin film where all the life in the universe, as far as we know, is, is concentrated. It's called the biosphere. And if that were an egg, the biosphere would be thinner than the egg shell. It's a very small space where we have all the life. But we've chopped up that space into private land ownership. You know, Tom owns this, Dick owns this, Harry owns this, Mary owns that. All right, well, along with that private land ownership, though, comes the responsibility of, of caring, of preserving, of sustaining, perhaps, all the life in the universe. I can't think of a more awesome responsibility than that. This is a church in, in, in Mississippi I drove by, and everybody's inside worshiping God's creations, and on the outside, they're killing it with this giant lawn. We're not thinking. We're not thinking. We can preserve life in, in, in landscapes like this. We must preserve life in landscapes like this, or we're going to lose it. And of course, we can't afford to lose it. And that means we've got to raise the bar about what we ask our landscapes to do. In the past, we have asked them to be pretty. We have decided that plants are just decorations. And we decided that because they are decorations. They're beautiful. We can decorate our landscapes. Uh, so for the past, at least the past century, actually a lot more than that, we have gone to the nursery to buy plants based on how pretty they are. You know, maybe, maybe they could be screen anchors or focal points, but it's all been about the decorative value of those, those plants. No th thought to the ecological roles those plants need to, to perform on our properties. And the reason we haven't thought about that is there used to be a lot of nature out there doing all that stuff. We didn't, we didn't care about that. But when we, when we choose plants based only on their, their decorative value, only on aesthetics, then landscaping equals ecological destruction. We can, though, find plants that are pretty, plants that are aesthetically pleasing, that also support food webs, that, that deliver the ecosystem services we need, that support communities of healthy natural uh, enemies, uh, that, that, that support our pollinators and, and protect our watersheds and do all the things we need our plants to be doing at home. In other words, we're going to choose plants where we include function as one of the criteria. And when we do that, then landscaping equals ecological restoration. And I'm going to call this 21st century landscaping. We're done with 20th century landscaping. That hasn't worked out. That hasn't worked out. We're facing the, the sixth great extinction on planet Earth, uh, and that has been one of the, one of the causes. So this is the, this is the future. What does anything, any of this have to do with making insects? We cannot restore ecosystem function anywhere unless you restore the insects that run those ecosystems. So let's talk about how we're going to do that. First, we have to decide which insects we're going to make. There are a lot of insects out there, three to four million species estimated worldwide, and it's estimated because uh, most of them are still undescribed. We have 164,000 described species in the US, many more undescribed. Uh, so a lot of species out there, and we're not going to make them all in any one place. So let's focus on the two groups of insects that uh, are the most important. And that would be the insects that maintain plant diversity and the insects that contribute the most energy to food webs that support all the other life out there. So we're talking about pollinators uh, and we're talking about caterpillars. Who says those are the two most important groups? 
I do, and I'm giving this talk. So. <laughs> Somebody out there is going to argue with me, I know, but we're going to focus on, on these two. So let's start with, with pollinators. Why do we need pollinators? I know what you're going to say. We need pollinators because they pollinate our crops, a third of our crops. Um, that figure actually has been, been questioned lately. It's probably more like 7% of our crops. Um, and they are important for pollinating some of our crops. But that is not the major reason we need pollinators. They pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. If we lost our pollinators, we would lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet. And that's not an option. That's that collapse of food webs that EO was talking about. Simply not an option. OK, what is a pollinator? You'd think we would, we would all agree on this, but uh, we don't. Most people see insects come to flowers, and automatically they assume they are pollinators. But actually, most of the insects that come to flowers are not transferring pollen from the male part of the flowers to the female flowers. Uh, so we call them flower visitors. They are taking pollen, they are taking nectar, uh, but they're actually not pollinating the flowers. So flower visitors, uh, and they're, you know, they're important, but if we're really going to talk about saving our pollinators, we've got to focus on the insects doing most of the pollination. We have one species of honeybee that we've introduced to this country, uh, and it's very good at, at pollinating a number of the crops we also introduced. We have 4,000 species of native bees. Uh, that did all of, almost all of the pollination in North America before we brought the honeybee over here. And we have about 14,000 species of moths and butterflies that um, individually typically are not nearly as good a pollinator as, as bees are, but you put them all together and you also recognize that most of the pollination these guys do, it's really by moths, and it happens at night when we don't see it. Um, so collectively they become an important component of, of the pollinator community as well. Now I tell people, uh, I ask people, please consider supporting bees on your property at home. And they say, no, I do not want to get stung. And I say, the native bees aren't going to sting you. And they say, yes, they do. I was stung last week. And what they mean is they were stung by a yellow jacket. We've got some, some sketchy taxonomy here. People see something. It looks like a bee. It stings them. So it is a bee, when actually it's a social wasp, a yellow jacket, they're very aggressive, they're protecting their hives. Uh, Bald-faced hornets are, are just black yellow jackets, they're doing the same thing. And that's not what um, I'm asking you to do. We're not trying to promote uh, yellow jackets. These guys are not pollinators, by the way. These guys are, are predators. They're eating my caterpillars. So we're talking about the bees that really, you can, you can go up to a bee that's foraging and you can pet it while it's foraging and it will ignore you. And our native bees, except for the, the uh, bumblebees, they are social and they have small hives and they protect them non-aggressively. Honeybees are the ones that sting you as far as the bees goes. The rest of the guys, no stinging at all. So how do we make those, those harmless pollinators in our yard? We have to give them the things they need. They need a place to live and they need something to eat. Where do our native bees nest? Well, they nest in the ground, they nest in woody stems, and they nest in pithy stems. 70% of our native bees are ground nesters. <clears throat> and if you own property, my guess is you own ground. <laughs> and that gives you the option to help these, these bees. Um, and they will nest in, they prefer slight uh, south-facing slope um, they, it, it should be some place where the sun hits it. So they like some little sunny spots um, where there's vegetation cleared away. But they will nest in almost any soil that's diggable. So anything but compact clay is going to be an option for your, your ground nesting bees. That's a little coletted bee there hiding in there. These guys are very, very shy. As soon as your shadow hits them, they dive back in their, their hole. Um, so it's single females that dig a tunnel, and then they, they rear a few on, offspring in that tunnel. Um, underground. Pithy stem nesters are nesting in pithy stems. Um, so this is a, a rose bush, but uh, you know, uh, native hydrangeas and, and goldenrod, anything that has that pithy stem um, that's easily hollowed out by the bees, and they can make a series of cells and rear their young on pollen that's stuffed in in those cells. Uh, and this, of course, uh, creates a dilemma because they're also spending the winter in those pithy cells in those stems. So things like goldenrod here, uh, 
what do we do with it? We, we chop it down in the fall, and you've just thrown away all your pithy stem nesters. If you mulch it, you've ground, ground them up. So one thing you might do is, is cut it off. Actually, we found that, that Heather Holm has found that if you, most of, the nesting, most of the overwintering bees are within two feet of the ground, so you can cut off the top part, and it's not so bad. Or you can cut off the whole thing and then tie a string around it like a cornstalk decoration and, and stand it up someplace in your yard that's, that's a little bit out of the way. But, but neatening up the way we do is a threat to our, our overwintering pithy stem nesters. Woody stem nesters are doing exactly the same thing. This is elderberry. They love elderberry because it's soft wood. So when you get an elderberry branch that dies, they tunnel into it and they, they make their little, little uh, cells. <clears throat> But again, what do we do when something, when a branch dies on our, our plants? We typically prune it out because we're very, we're very neat. Um, so if you can leave a few dead branches, that would be great. But most, particularly suburban homes, do not have nearly enough woody or pithy stem nest sites for our native bees. So we have come up with a solution. We call them bee hotels. Uh, and we humans really like these bee hotels. Some people, Go crazy making bee hotels <laughs> because they work. The bees do come, and they do nest in all those little holes, uh, and, and it's lots of fun to watch. The problem is we're putting all the bees in one place on our property, and research has now shown that that makes it really convenient for bee predators and bee diseases and bee parasites. All the bees are in one place, and when they find them, they clobber them. So it is much better if we make much smaller bee hotels and scatter them around our property so that all of our bees are not in one basket. That's the way it would be in, in nature. Okay, what do need, bees need to, to reproduce? They need pollen and they we need nectar. <clears throat> and they need it all the time. This is the distribution of, of native bee species in New England. They're around from March right through November. And any species that is around needs blooming plants that entire time. Uh, typically, the middle of the, the summer is a time when, when a lot of plants are not in bloom. Uh, that's deadly to bees if you're trying to support them on your property. They have to forage. They have to eat every day just like we do. They can't go two or three weeks without any forage at all. And this is a big problem for, for um, honeybee uh, colonies as well. Um, of course, honeybee colonies are suffering from lots of things, but lack of forage these days. The fact that we've taken so many plants away that are blooming is a huge problem for both our native bees and the introduced honeybee. So getting a sequence of bloom throughout the season is a, a challenge. It takes some, some uh, thought and some, some fancier gardening. Which species of plants should we use when we're trying to support bee, bee populations? Sam Drogi is, uh, he's Mr. Mr. Native Bee, works at Patuxent Wildlife Research Center in, in Maryland, and he probably knows more about native bees than anybody. He says we need to meet the needs of our bee specialists. If we plant the plants that our specialists need, the generalists will follow. Generalists can use lots of, of plants. So a lot of people go out there and they put in zinnias and butterfly bush and a bunch of other non-native plants, and they see bees come and they say, I have helped the pollinators. Well, there's a few species of, of generalist bees that can use those plants, but you've eliminated all the specialist bees that need particular native plant genera. Why do bees specialize? Because plants differ a whole bunch. They differ in when they flower, they differ, differ in what they look like, they differ in what they smell like, uh, they differ in pollen morphology. And of course, bees are picking up the pollen with hairs on their legs. And if you specialize, you can get very good at picking up the pollen of particular types of plants. Plants like bee specialization because those are the bees that are going to transfer the pollen most efficiently from the male to the female parts. The generalist bees often are messing it up. They're going to the wrong flowers, and they don't do it very well. Um, also, they differ dramatically in their nutritional value. So it's another reason that bees specialize on particular groups of pollen. Um, so here are, are uh, just some of the, the bee specialists that we've recognized so far. In the upper Midwest here, sunflowers are number one. They support 13 species of, of specialists. Asters, number two, 12 species. Goldenrods, 11 species. Evening primrose, 11. Willows, nine. Just with those five genera, you've got over 50 species of, of bees that won't be in your yard if you don't have those plants in your yard. 
So meeting the needs of the specialists is important. If you want Andrena asteroides, you need native asters. If you want Andrena origine, you need spring beauties. There's no compromise here. Calides albescens needs false indigo and so on. And if you want to know our current state of knowledge of, of uh, native bee specialization, go to Heather Holmes' book. Uh, this is her latest book on identification and native plant forage guide, just called Bees. And I guess you can get it on, on Amazon. And she'll tell you which ones are the specialists. But I will tell you right now, out of the 4,000 species of native bees that are out there, we only know a, a smattering of them. Um, so if you put in some native flowering plants, chances are it's going to support specialists. All right, let's talk about caterpillars. Let's talk about those insects that are transferring most of the energy uh, from plants to uh, particularly to vertebrates uh, above them in higher trophic levels. Most animals don't eat plants directly. They eat something that ate a plant, and most of that something is, is caterpillars. Let's talk about uh, birds. We'll use bird food webs as an example. We've already mentioned that birds need, need insects to reproduce, uh, and they do. 96% of our terrestrial North American birds are reproducing on insects. Yes, they eat seeds and berries after they've reproduced, but most of our baby birds cannot eat seeds and berries. So you don't have baby birds if you don't have the insects that allow uh, reproduction. Uh, and most of the insects that, that these, these uh, birds are reproducing on turn out to be caterpillars. So let's talk about why. What is special about caterpillars? There are a number of things that are special. One, one is that they are relatively soft prey items. If you think of this caterpillar as, as like a sausage, it's got a very thin wrapper. That thin wrapper is its exoskeleton, its cuticle. Uh, which is undigestible. You don't want a lot of cuticle there. And the rest of it is, is good food. Uh, and because they're soft, you can stuff it down the throat of your, your baby without fear of injuring them. And if you've ever watched a, a, a parent feed its young, they're pretty rough. They're, it's like a plunger. They just take their beak and stuff it down there. <laughs> they're relatively large prey items. One medium-sized caterpillar is, is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. And some of our smaller birds do chase aphids around, but do you want to chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar. They're nutritious. They're very high in protein, very high in fats. They have a very low percentage of chitin compared to other types of, of insects, like beetles. Beetles aren't sausages. They're like little tanks. Most, most of what you're getting when you eat a beetle is exoskeleton. And again, that's undigestible. And it turns out that caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. Now, later on in the season, they get a lot of carotenoids from berries. Uh, but the berries aren't, aren't ripe in the spring. So they're eating caterpillars. Why do I mention carotenoids? Because vertebrates don't make carotenoids, yet they are essential components of our diets. We all absolutely need them. And that's why my, my wife, Cindy, says I have to eat my carrots to get my beta carotene and my, my tomatoes to get my lycopene and my whatever that is up in the corner there to get my lutein. And she makes sure I, I eat all of those things because if I do, they stimulate my immune system. I am generally healthier if I have a lot of carotenoids in my diet. They are antioxidants. They run around our, our, our body and protect our DNA from oxidative damage. They improve color vision. When your mother said, eat your carrots, you will see better, she was right. She didn't know she was right, but it turns out she was right. They improve sperm vitality. Who doesn't need that? They improve sexual attractiveness. Now we're talking about male birds in particular that take carotenoids and build pigments out of them and then put those pigments in their feathers. So that is a, a, a male prothonotary warbler, and he is bright yellow, yellow because he has had access to lots of lutines. And the brighter yellow he is, the more ladies he attracts. We've just finished a study looking at the, the carotenoid content of various groups of, of invertebrates, mostly insects, that are eaten by birds. Uh, and it turns out the first two bars there on the left are types of caterpillars. They lead the way in the total amount of carotenoid content. Crickets are the next highest level. Spiders are way down the list there. There are five times fewer carotenoids in spiders than there are in caterpillars. And spiders are important components of bird food webs. Right at the very end are earthworms. So the early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. So. So it's, it suggests that caterpillars are, are really important for bird diets. And if you look at 7,628 feeding observations for bluebirds, where we know exactly what they're feeding their babies, 
um, it, it says that, yeah, there is a, a perfect correlation between the carotenoid content of those caterpillars and the frequency with which the birds are taking them as, as prey items. So they take caterpillars the most frequently, uh, crickets next, and everybody else is way, way down. So all this is suggesting that caterpillars may not be optional parts of bird diets. They may be essential parts, excuse me, of bird diets. And that means if you're a bird, you're not going to be able to breed successfully if you're in an area where there are not enough caterpillars. So how do we increase the number of caterpillars in, in our yards? Well, let's first talk about how not to make caterpillars in our yards. This is what the landscapes around me look like. This, everybody wants to be gone with the wind here. I don't know how many acres that is. I do know that all the creatures that used to live there are, are now gone with the wind. Um, you know, we have to stop worshiping the lawn. This is the Lawn of the Week Award, or Lawn of the Month Award uh, in St. Louis. Somebody always sends me these slides. So this family got an award for creating the deadest landscape. We can't afford to do that anymore. We just can't afford to do that anymore. We add caterpillars to landscapes by adding the plants that make them. Most plants, like this Kentucky coffee tree, it's a good native, but most of them don't make a lot of insects. Why? Because plants don't want insects to eat them. They don't want to be eaten. They want to load their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those plants either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense that keeps most of the, plants of the, most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why when your snow melts, I presume it's going to green up here in Wisconsin. <coughs> it's green out there, not because there's no insects out there that want to eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat those plants. They are too well protected chemically. But we do know that insects eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, they specialize. Insect specialization on particular plant lineages is the most common type of specialization in the entire world. 90% of the insects that eat plants can only develop on the plants of particular lineages that they have developed specialized adaptations to beat those chemical defenses. So they pick one or two plant lineages that, that share common cocktail of defenses, and then they develop the enzymes and the behavioral adaptations and the life history adaptations that, that protect them from those chemicals. It allows them to eat those plants without dying. But it takes a long period of exposure to those plant lineages for all these adaptations to fall into place. That does not happen overnight. And that's why when we plant burning bush or, or bush honeysuckle or any of those other non-natives I was talking about, uh, they have not been here long enough for our insects to have adapted to those chemical defenses. So they're essentially sterile additions to our, our landscape. I'm going to use the monarch butterfly as an example, just to hammer home this point, because you already know half the story of the monarch. Uh, you already know that monarchs are specialists on milkweeds, that single lineage. And you probably know that milkweeds are toxic plants. They're filled with cardiac glycosides, which is why you and I don't eat milkweeds. And if we did, it would stop our heart. That's what cardiac glycosides do. Monarchs can eat milkweeds, and it doesn't stop their heart, and they do have a heart, by the way, because they have the enzymes that, that detoxify and store and excrete cardiac glycosides. That's part of the story. That's the part of the story you already know, but what about the sticky latex sap that gives milkweeds its common name? If you break open a milkweed vein, you get all this stick, white goo that comes out. Uh, if you get it on your finger, you usually wipe it off right away, but if you don't, and let it sit there maybe a minute Two minutes, it starts to gel. When it's exposed to oxygen, it turns into a chewing gum-like substance, and that's its defensive property. If a caterpillar smears that all over its mouth parts, it glues its mouth shut. It's not funny for the caterpillar because it starves to death then. <laughs> but we do know that monarchs eat milkweed leaves. So how do they eat milkweed leaves without gluing their mouth parts shut? Well, this is a behavioral adaptation that allow them to avoid the sticky latex sap. The first thing a monarch does is typically go to the, tip, the end of a leaf and it starts to eat. And if any, any uh, latex sap starts to ooze out, it'll stop eating immediately, turn around, go back up the, the leaf, and it starts to chew through the midrib. 
and it chews and it chews till it has completely severed the midrib. And what that has done is block the flow of, of latex from the, the proximal end of the leaf to the distal end of the leaf. Uh, and that means the monitor can then turn around, go back down, and eat the leaf without any latex sap coming out at all. It's a very simple behavioral adaptation. All it does is chew through the midrib, but it's one that most insects have not figured out how to do. And that's the upside of specialization. The monarch has figured out over evolutionary time how to eat milkweeds without dying. But in spending all that, that, that time figuring out how to get around the defenses in milkweed, they haven't spent any evolutionary time developing adaptations to get around the tannins that are in oaks, or the cucurbitaceans in cucurbits, or the nicotine in tobacco, or the, the cyanide in, in cherries. Every plant lineage has defensive compounds, and the monarch can only get around one. We have 2,137 plant genera in, in North America, and the monarchs can only eat one. That's host plant specialization. It works fine for the monarchs, as long as we have that genus around. But if we take the milkweeds away, if we take Asclepius away, then the monarch disappears. It is not going to start eating corn or soybeans or, or anything else. Uh, and that's why in 2013, we only had 3.6% of the monarchs left west of the, the Rocky Mountains today, California, there's, they have lost 99.9% .9 of their, their monarchs. That monarch population is on the brink of extinction, and we hope that they make it another year. Why? Because we've taken the milkweeds away. It's very simple. So plant choice matters. That's all I'm trying to say here. You've got to put the plants that make the insects in your yard if you want those insects. If you want the Pandora sphinx, sphinx you have to have Virginia creeper. And I want that beautiful moth at home, so I have Virginia creeper. If I want the tulip tree silk moth, I need tulip trees. If I want the luna moth uh, in the east coast, it's going to be sweet gun that produces the luna moth. You're not going to have the zebra swallowtail, which I think is the most beautiful swallowtail without pawpaw. It's the only thing it eats. Grapes produce a lot of, lot of insects, eight-spotted forester moth. Of course, these are just examples from these plants. The green marvel is on viburnum. The brown-hooded owlet is on goldenrod. The beautiful utilia is on poison ivy. Yes, poison ivy. You know when you get poison ivy? When you try to pull it out. <laughs> Leave it alone. <laughs> you can run faster than it can. The best defense against poison ivy is to learn what it looks like and just don't touch it. Sculptured moth on persimmon, the Hebrew on black gum, the fawn sphinx is one of 95 species of insects that will disappear if we lose our, our ashes. Beautiful sphinx moth. Maples are productive. Rosy maple moth. Um, one, my favorite large moth is the royal walnut moth on uh, walnut and hickory. Elm, really productive plant, double tooth prominent on that. Witch hazel uh, dagger moth on witch hazel. Imperial moth on pine, even our clematis are, are making uh, moths. The spotted thyrus is on clematis. Ironweed makes two-toned ancillus. Lost owlet on buttonbush. The herald on native willows. Snowberry clearwing on coral honeysuckle. The evening primrose moth is on evening primrose. Showy emerald on sumac, and I'm not talking about poison sumac. That's a plant of the swamp. I've never even seen one. I'm talking about smooth sumac or staghorn sumac. Perfect soil stabilizers. There's no reason why we have to go to a plant from Asia to stabilize our soil, and it makes that beautiful moth. Then we have the, the real powerhouses like our native prunus, black cherry, produce the white furcula, the crocus geometer, the io moth, the cecropia moth, colorful zaley, the tufted bird dropping moth. And I ask you, who would not want the tufted bird dropping moth? <laughs> the paddle caterpillar. Ask your kids what those paddles are for. They have a function. They're not there for, for decorations. They have a function. And I'm not going to tell you what it is. I want you to think about it. It's the same reason that the filament geometer has these hydra-like filaments coming out its, its back. Small-eyed sphinx, all of these guys are on, on uh, black cherries. Harris's three-spot that wears its shed uh, um, cuticle from its, its head capsule like an umbrella over its head. Nobody knows why it does that. Then the most powerful uh, plant of all, oaks, produce the hag moth, the red wash prominent, the white dotted prominent, spiny oak moth, the skip moth, the white blotch heterocampa, the oak skeletonizer, the solitary oak leaf miner, the crown bucolatrix, half oval ancillus, 
pink striped oakworm, and my favorite, the spun glass caterpillar, plus literally hundreds more species on your, your oaks. Where did I take all those pictures? In my front yard. I want to emphasize front yard. I hate talking about backyard habitats because that implies that everything we're talking about is so ugly that we have to hide it in our backyard. We do not. You can put your oak trees in the front yard. That's what my front yard looked like when we moved in. Um, the, the property had been mowed for hay, so uh, not many plants there. That's what it looked like a few years ago from the same position. I am counting the number of moths at my house. I'm in the third year, and I'm up to 882 species of, of moths, and it'll probably top out around 1,000. Why? Because we planted all of those plants. We planted our witch hazel and our oaks and our persimmons and American elms and all of those other guys. But importantly, we tolerated plants that most people typically pull out. They say, oh, they're weeds, like black cherry, like New York fern and grapes and tulip trees and Virginia creeper, like our poison ivy, like our dotter and our greenbrier. Every time you add a new plant lineage to your yard, you're going to get new moths. And when you do that, you're going to get the birds that eat those moths. You know, I could talk about rodents that eat moths too, but most people don't care about that. So we'll just talk about birds. We added, we have 55 species of breeding birds at home. Um, and we added this one last year, the wood, wood thrush. Wood thrush is, is, of course, a, um, it's a forest bird. None of our trees are, are older than 18 years. That's how long we've been there. But they're now big enough, and there's enough leaf litter that the wood thrush says, OK, and there's enough food. We've got Virginia creeper making the lettered sphinx, so the wood thrush successfully bred there. Uh, we have indigo bunnings because we have alders making ruby quakers. We have chipping sparrows because we have black walnuts making gray edge boma locas. We have field sparrows because we have oaks making red line panopoders and tufted tip mice because we have black cherries making dowdy pinions. We have Phoebes because we have native grasses making skippers, and of course our, our chickadees because we have tulip trees making tulip tree beauties, wide-eyed vireos because we have spicebush making spicebush swallowtails, house wrens because we have hickories making copper underwings, bluebirds because we have sycamores making drab prominence, and on and on and on. 55 species now. And it didn't take 18 years to get those 55 species. Many of them came right away. So which plants should you be sure to have in your, your landscape? Um, that, that's a very good question. We now have this tool we've been working on for a while. It's called Native Plant Finder. It is launched on the National Wildlife Federation website. All you have to do is go to the National Wildlife Federation website, put in Native Plant Finder, and it will prompt you to put in your zip code. And when you do that, the ranked list of woody plants and herbaceous plants, ranked in terms of their ability to support food webs, will pop up for your county. So now you get it tailored for exactly where you live. And this is true for anywhere in the entire country. <clears throat> when we had this list of ranked plants for every county in the country, we saw a, a very important pattern. And that is, there are really just a few plants in any one place making most of the food. About 5% of our native plant species in any one place is making about 75% of the food that drives these food webs. That means 95% of the native plants in our area aren't making that much food. So I started calling that 5% keystone plants uh, because just like in a Roman arch, you have the Roman arch, the keystones at the center. If you take the keystone out, the arch collapses. If you take these keystone plants out of your food web, the food web collapses. So the question now, because we're recognizing that some native plants are so much better than other native plants, the question is not whether natives are better than non-natives, it's, it's whether ecologically productive plants are more desirable in our landscapes than ecologically unproductive plants. That's what we have to think about. For example, I get emails all the time reminding me that ginkgos were in North America. Right now it's a, it's a plant from Asia. They grew in North America seven million years ago. Therefore, they're native. I don't care if they're growing on the moon. Ginkgos produce zero caterpillars, which means they're not supporting food webs. So if we talk about productivity, we don't have to, we don't have to argue about what's native and what's not native. Zelkova, you know, really overused uh, street tree, another one from, uh, from Asia, produces uh, zero caterpillars. 
English ivy, zero caterpillar. So lot, these plants that we're bringing over are not supporting the food webs that we need them to support. And when we landscape with these plants, we're not fooling the birds. I have a, uh, a student, well, she's not my student anymore. She graduated, Desiree Naranjo, who uh, studied Carolina chickadee reproduction in the suburbs of Washington, DC. And she asked a simple question. What is the success rate of, of chickadee reproduction in a landscape depending on the plants in that landscape? So how does it vary as you change the plants in that landscape? And she looked at 93 pairs of breeding chickadees all over uh, the suburbs of DC. Um, I hope you can, can see that. There's a red line uh, surrounding a bunch of blue areas there with a star in the middle. The star, this is the foraging territory of one pair of chickadees. The star is where the nest is. Uh, and the red line represents the 95% the, uh, of the foraging territory. So they did 95% of their foraging within that red line, and they did it on those blue areas. The blue areas are particular trees. Let's look at what they are. If you can't read it, it's basswood and sweet gum, American elm, black cherry, and two species of oaks. All the native trees in that little section of Washington, D.C. Let's also look at the trees the birds did not forage on, and they're all the trees from Asia. So you have Japanese ma maples and silk trees, and, and our friend the ginkgo, and black poplar, saucer magnolia, crepe myrtles. And it's very easy to picture a landscape in which they are the dominant plants. And when they are, uh, you can make these comparisons. These are results from, from Desiree's project. If she compared primarily native landscapes, none of them were 100% native, with landscapes introduced, dominated by introduced plants, the landscapes dominated by introduced plants produce 75% fewer caterpillars. So right away, you reduce the amount of food for these birds by 75%. They were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. So Desiree would put up a nest box, and tree holes are in short supply in that area, so the birds try to use it. But um, some of the birds would come and look around, and they had the ability to assess the quality of the habitat. And they said, there's simply not enough food here. We're not even going to try. If they did try, the nest contained 1.5 fewer eggs. They were 29% less likely to survive. They produced 1.2 fewer fledglings. And it took them 1.5 days longer to, to uh, fledge. And when they fledged, those chicks were lighter than the, the chicks from a native landscape. And you might say, well, those aren't huge differences. But when we put all that into a population growth model, this is what you get. The bottom line is the percentage of non-native plants in the landscape, from 0 on the, the left to 100% on the right. The dotted line is replacement rate. That is the number of chicks the population has to make each year just to replace the adults that are lost each year. If you are reproducing at the dotted line level, that's a sustainable population. It can go on forever. If you're below the dotted line, it's a declining population. And if you're above the population, the dotted line, it's a growing population. Um, so I hope you can see that the only time you're at or above the dotted line is when there's 30% or less non-native plants in the landscape. So in other words, you need 70% native plants to, to reach a sustainable population uh, in the landscape. And the important thing about this study is that this is the first time that the, the success of reproduction has been tied to landscape plants for any bird. So it's a valuable piece of information. It shows that your plant choices at home really do impact the life around you. But it also gives us some wiggle room. Um, if you really do need that crepe myrtle or you need that, that can't be a, an, an invasive plant, but, but uh, I don't know, maybe you need your ginkgo. That's OK as long as it's not dominating your landscape. You've got to have uh, native plants dominating your landscapes. And then the birds will still be able to reproduce. She also looked at the, the um, migrating birds that moved through her landscape. 51 species of migrating birds stopped and rested in her, her little suburban plots there. And of course, migrants are flying all night. They can fly up to 300 miles in a single night. And when they come down, People say they're resting, but what they're really doing is gassing up. They've got to refuel. They've got to put that 35 to 50 percent of their body weight back on. And if they come down in the land of ginkgo, they're not adding any, any body weight. And that can be the end of their migration. So a lot of people say, well, I don't have a property big enough to support a breeding bird. But if you have a property big enough to support one tree and you make it the right tree, you can support migrating birds. And they, they're not flying around our cities. They're flying right through them. Your trees and your property are part of migration routes, and they're very important. 
How we plant these trees is also very important for moss survival. Yes, we want the caterpillars, but you're not going to have them unless you have the adult moths to lay those caterpillars. Let me just give you an example from Pennsylvania. 511 species of caterpillars on oaks in Pennsylvania. A few of them complete their life cycle on the oak tree. This is the polyphemus moth. The caterpillars eat the leaves, and they spin a cocoon, and they hang from the branches, and they overwinter there, and everything happens on the tree. But that's unusual. 480 of those species, 94%, drop from the tree, and they pupate in the soil, or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that is underneath the tree. So if the soil is compacted and we have no leaf litter, you've just wiped out 480 of those species. Uh, and this is a typical way that we landscape. That, you know, and then we mow them, too. So, um, and of course, the cement landscape is, is, is even worse. Uh, this is really a typical way, and we're not sure how well the moths uh, survive in a situation like this. But this is an example where you can build the layered landscapes uh, that, that Rick and I talk about in our, our second book. When you picture the canopy, you don't want air all the way down to the ground. You want, you want it to look like a natural habitat. So put in your understory trees and your shrubs and then your ground covers. And when the moths drop down, they can pupate in that soil and they won't get squished or mowed. Um, so here's a layered landscape in, in Alaska with a birch tree and then some red elderberry and other things there. Very safe place for these moths to, to uh, complete their development. This is a good place to do your spring ephemeral gardening. You're not going to go tramping through the, there squishing those, those moths. Or to have your ground covers like, like may apples or, or wild ginger or pachysandra. How about native pachysandra? Why do we need pachysandra from, from Asia? I do not know. Okay, final thing I'm going to talk about uh, are security lights, because security lights are killing moths all night long. Put your security light, put a motion sensor on your security light. If you must have one, put a motion sensor on your security light so that it only turns on when the bad man comes. Supposedly, that's why we, we have security lights. It's actually just become a societal habit. Got to have a light on all night long, and we don't even think about why. Uh, but the moths are attracted to those lights, and don't ask me why. After 100 years, nobody's been able to figure it out. And they fly around till they're exhausted. Many moths uh, don't feed as adults, so they, they have all the energy they're ever going to have as an adult. And they spend their time flying around a light, using up that energy. Bats come and pick them off. Um, or they sit on the side of the, the wall in the morning, and the birds come and pick them off. They're death traps for, for our moths. There was a study came out last year in, in Europe. Even Knopp and some, some others uh, had night vision goggles. And she was in a field and they counted all the moths that were pollinating the plants at night. Uh, and then they erected lights in that field. And the number of moths dropped, what, 62% when the lights came up. So the lights really are devastating our, our moth populations. The point of this entire talk is to try to convince you that if we choose the right plants, and if we use more of them, reduce the area that's in lawn, we really can make insects almost anywhere, almost anywhere. And I want to close by returning to my, my buddy E.O. Wilson, who uh, still writes a book a year. The book he wrote in 2016 was called Half Earth, Our Planet's Fight for Life. Has anybody read Half Earth? One, yeah, it's always one person. E.O.'s... <laughs> He is not trying to get, get uh, uh, Pulitzer Prizes anymore. Um, he's actually feeling pretty desperate. Uh, he sees the life around us disappearing. He wants to save it. And he says, in order to save life on Earth, we have to have functional ecosystems on half of planet Earth. We need that much space. And he spends the rest of the book uh, talking about the science that supports that statement. What he doesn't spend a lot of time doing is telling us how we're going to do that. So even crazy people like me that say, half Earth, that'd be great, we scratch our heads and say, EO, how are we going to do that? How is it possible? We already are farming half the Earth, and, and all of the infrastructure and 7.6 billion people are stuffed in the other half. We can do it. We can do it, but to realize EO's dreams of, of, of saving half the Earth, we need a new approach to conservation. You know, in the past, we've had this idea that humans are here and nature's someplace else, and that's the way we pursued conservation, trying to conserve things where there are no humans. That's getting tougher and tougher, and it's not enough space. So now we need to save it where there are humans. 
We need to save it where we live, where we work, where we play, and as much as we can, where we farm. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. And that terminology drives me crazy because all places have ecological significance, even yards like this. We cannot afford to take major parts of the earth and say, oh, you don't count anymore. We need as much functional earth as, as possible. So we're, again, where are we going to do it? We're going to do it on that private property. We're going to do it on the land that you own or the land that you manage. You don't have to save biodiversity for a living, although this is one group where most of you are saving biodiversity for a living, and that's great. But you can save it where you live. And this approach, I really like this approach because it empowers each one of us. Um, now each one of us is an important component of the, the conservation effort. Uh, it also shrinks the problem down to something manageable. Just worry about what's happening on your own property. Get rid of the invasive plants, put in the productive plants, uh, and if you do that, you should, be, you should be happy. If everybody does it, we're done. So as property owners, each one of us has the power, and each one of us does have the responsibility to fix this. We can turn it into something like this, so let's do that. Thank you very much. <laughs>